For more than two centuries, Marie Antoinette has continued to kindle the imagination of the public. Her countless supporters and biographers still seek the slightest detail of her life, cut short by the blade of the guillotine. The relationship of the French queen with Count Axel von Fersen, a Swedish aristocrat who became minister to the King of France, remains a subject of controversy. Some want proof that she had a fairy tale love affair with him, while others unconditionally maintain that she was a queen incapable of carrying out her duties as a royal wife. Did Marie Antoinette have an affair with Axel von Fersen? That is the question that keeps coming back. The answer may lie in the letters they exchanged during the French Revolution, from the flight to Varennes to the fall of the monarchy. A number of redacted passages have tickled the curiosity of historians, but despite several attempts to decipher these redactions, they remain illegible. Did her supporters cast a veil of modesty over a steamy story of love? Today, a team of scientists is preparing to scan the precious letters kept in the French National Archives. Will science solve the mystery of the Queen's love life, which has set generations of supporters against each other? Housed in the Paris Museum of Music, the scientists of the Center for Research on Preservation have spent recent months passing the precious letters through a state-of-the-art scanner. The laser beams focused on the redacted parts plunge into the heart of the material and reveal the chemical makeup of the inks used through the fluorescence produced by X-rays. We'll do the letter dated September 26, 1791. Okay, tell me where. Start with line one, a bit further to the right. With painstaking patience, the scientists map each redaction, gradually perfecting their methods, and manage what until now has seemed impossible. The result is striking. I shall end there, but not without telling you, my dear and gentle friend, that I love you madly, and there is never a moment in which I do not adore you. I shall end there, but not without telling you, my dear and gentle friend, that I love you madly, and there is never a moment in which I do not adore you. What is a redaction? It's not a simple crossing out. When you write something, realize you've made a mistake, furiously cross it out, and then continue writing. The redaction here is extremely sophisticated. It's a collection of scribbles tightly packed on top of each other. With characters added, notably letters with tail strokes that go above or below the line, like P's and T's and L's. And dots are added, seemingly to trick anyone trying to read behind the scribbles. This is the start of the redaction. How many lines? We have that one. Let's try the next line. So, up a bit? Yeah, up and to the left. I think we can get that whole section. Do you think we should put it more horizontal? I shall end there, but not without telling you, my dear and gentle friend, that I love you madly, and there is never a moment in which I do not adore you.
It was at Lustad Castle to the south of Stockholm that Count Axel von Fersen spent some of his teenage years. The heir of a powerful Swedish aristocratic family with close ties to the ruling dynasty, in 1770, he embarked on the grand tour across Europe to complete his education. When he was presented to the court of Versailles four years later, as a young man of 19, he made a lasting impression. One evening, at an opera house ball, where only the women were masked and disguised beneath a cloak and hood, one of them approached him and engaged him in conversation. Fersen soon realized it was the Dauphine herself, Marie Antoinette. That was their first encounter, and neither of them would ever forget it. A few months later, Louis XVI, at the tender age of 20, succeeded his grandfather Louis XV to the French throne. Marie Antoinette became queen. Fersen left for London before returning to Sweden. He would return to France four years later. In the summer of 1778, a charming, handsome young man arrived at the court and presented himself to the royal household. The queen recognized him immediately. Ah, he's an old acquaintance. Fersen was there to offer his military services to Louis XVI. He was hoping for a post in the French army, just like his father before him. When the War of Independence broke out in the United States, Fersen enlisted with a French expeditionary force about to set sail for America. Regarding Fersen leaving Versailles, there's a letter from the Swedish ambassador to his king saying that he noticed tears in the French queen's eyes as she watched the young man leave the court. When he returned to France, he immediately rushed to the queen's side. He wrote to his sister in Sweden and expressed his feelings. I cannot explain why I am the happiest of men. I have made my decision. I will never be bound in marriage. It is against nature. I cannot wed the sole woman I would wish to wed, the sole woman who truly loves me. Therefore, I will wed nobody. The Queen's feelings hadn't been dampened by their three-year separation. Soon after Fersen's return from America, he was given the command of the Swedish Royal Regiment, which allowed him to stay in France. From then on, he divided his time between his military duties and Versailles. The love that Marie Antoinette and Fersen felt for each other helped the young queen to blossom. They saw each other in secret whenever they could. The queen's private life took place elsewhere, not here, where she was always on public view. Her private area wasn't far away, because you can see to the left of the bed a small door that led to her interior cabinets. Her private life was led in these small rooms, notably at the Trianon, but also during strolls in the grounds or outings, sometimes to Paris. At the Palace of Versailles, some secret staircases known only to the Queen's private staff led to these rooms. Marie Antoinette could therefore receive who she liked, far from the view of gossiping courtesans. This is the second floor. And amusingly, these rooms, after a long period when it was taboo and nobody dared mention it, are now referred to as the Fersen rooms. Because we believe that not only did Fersen visit the Queen here, he may have actually lived here. So it might have been an apartment for him, right next to the Queen. They're just two small rooms, but at Versailles, small was nonetheless important. Lots of courtiers were attributed such small spaces, but these were next to the Queen's private apartments, so in the heart of the system. Fersen would come and go with nobody seeing him. Well, I don't think you can never say nobody when it comes to Versailles, because the Queen wasn't just one person, but a small entourage. There was always someone. The Queen couldn't go anywhere alone. 
Here she could act like an ordinary woman, but it's still extraordinary to imagine her receiving a man she was madly in love with in a relatively discreet way without it ever coming out into the open. At the Petit Trianon, where she escaped from the weight of her ceremonial duties, Marie Antoinette created her dream setting. Three or four times a week, Fersen visited her small private estate. But these fleeting moments of bliss were short-lived. The troubles beyond the palace gates were starting to seriously worry the queen. In the spring of 1789, in an attempt to quell the crisis spreading through his kingdom, Louis XVI called a meeting of the Estates General, which proclaimed itself the Constituent National Assembly. Its members wished to turn absolute monarchy into a constitutional monarchy. This came as a huge shock to the royal couple. Backed by his queen, Louis XVI ordered his troops to surround Paris in an attempt to dissolve the assembly. But Paris rose up. The king's troops refused to turn on the people, and the Bastille fell. The masses began to call for the queen's head. The summer of 1789 was frightful for Marie Antoinette. And on October 5th, the women of Paris, accompanied by quite a lot of men, marched on Versailles, demanding bread from the king. But what they really wanted was the king inside Paris to prevent him from leading a counter-revolution. Marie-Antoinette Marie Antoinette saw her bodyguards beheaded with knives or swords, and she herself was chased through her apartments. She hated the revolution, which is understandable, but she too was a hated woman. The hatred of some created hatred in others. On October the 6th, under pressure from the mob, Louis XVI was forced to leave Versailles, leading the way with the heads of the royal bodyguard on pikes. Crammed into a small coach, the royal family made slow headway, bombarded with insults and threats from a frenzied mob. That evening, they stayed in the only inhabitable apartment in the Tuileries Palace, the former royal residence, abandoned for a number of decades. Traumatized by the violence, the king and queen felt like prisoners of the people of Paris. Most of their close friends had abandoned them. But Fersen, still present in Paris, refused to distance himself from Marie Antoinette's side. The members of the assembly were extremely optimistic. The only person who wasn't was the one who felt caught in a trap, the king. He would gradually realize that the revolution had gotten out of hand. So it was up to him to seize control of it and guide it back to what he had laid out in his speech of June 23, 1789, a revolution led by the king, a royal revolution. He was a king who had been crowned in Reims, a sovereign by divine right, God's lieutenant on earth. So the notion of a constitutional monarchy that removed most of his power was unacceptable to him. As the months went by, the king and queen attempted to break free of their isolation in a sham of courtly life. The assembly, now seated in Paris, continued to work on drafting a constitution which would deprive the king of most of his powers. The queen believed that the only way out was to flee from Paris to a stronghold where Louis could reassert his authority with the backing of loyal regiments and thus impose a constitution of his choosing. This was why, in February or March 1791, those supporters of the royal family began to organize their escape to Montmédy, where loyal troops were garrisoned. Because, don't forget, some regiments supported the revolution. Fersen was in on the secret and helped the royal family plan their escape. They managed to sneak out of the Tuileries Palace, which was under close watch. Fersen wanted to accompany the king and his family to their final destination. But the king refused to let Fersen go any further. Fersen 
June 23rd. All is lost, dear father. I am in despair. The king was arrested at Varennes, 16 leagues from the border. Please understand my pain and feel for me. I have time but to assure you of my respect and my love. The king and queen were brought back to the Tuileries, where they were locked up and reduced to silence. The king was suspended of his functions while the assembly decided what to do, because he had been caught red-handed in an act of treason, so to speak. Their residence was kept under watch. They could no longer come and go as they pleased, and their letters were intercepted. Also, many people in their entourage, if they hadn't already emigrated, started to leave. So they found themselves quite isolated in the palace, with the Paris mob inside the grounds screaming at their windows. After the dramatic return from Varennes, Marie Antoinette was quick to reassure Fersen, express her love for him, and inform home of the living conditions imposed on the royal family. From his refuge in Brussels, Fersen was prepared to appeal to the great powers in the king and queen's favor. This marked the beginning of their secret love letter and political correspondence, which has enthralled biographers of the queen over the past century. June 29th, 1791. I'm alive here, my beloved, for the reason to adore you. How concerned I am for you. Do not write to me. This would compromise all of us, and above all, do not return under any circumstances. It is known that it was you who helped us to get away from here, and all would be lost if you should show yourself. After the failed flight to Varennes, Fersen's situation became very complicated. He couldn't return to France because the revolutionaries knew he had helped with the king's escape. So in many ways, he was a wanted man. We are guarded day and night. I do not care. You are not here. Do not be troubled on my account. Nothing will happen to me. The National Assembly will show leniency. Farewell, the most loved of men. I cannot write any more, but nothing in the world could stop me adoring you up until death. They sent letters either by post or through messengers. Baron Gogola, an aide-de-camp to Louis XVI, was notably charged with smuggling their correspondence. They also used other means, for example, newspapers. She would receive a newspaper from Belgium, Journal de Brabant, and inside there would be a letter written in invisible ink. A highly confidential letter written between the lines of an innocent article. They would send each other gifts, like boxes of gloves or cookies, with false bottoms containing secret letters. She knew all the tricks for secret writing, as did Fersen. And that's why they were able to secretly correspond so successfully between 1789 and 1792, and were most likely never found out. Write to me in our code by post in a double envelope addressed to Monsieur de Goujin, care of Madame Brown. Send letters through your valet, and tell me where to address those I might write to you, for I cannot live without them. Some of Marie Antoinette and Fersen's letters were in code, a code invented by Fersen, leading up to the flight to Varennes. It was rather sophisticated and quite difficult for Marie Antoinette to use. Remember, she was watched all day long, so she wrote at night by candlelight. In 2008, mathematicians began working on the letters and gradually managed to decipher them. Thanks to their efforts, new passages and a whole new letter were revealed. The technique used by Marie Antoinette and Fersen was a form of cryptography known as polyalphabetic substitution. It basically uses two secret keys, so two secrets, a big secret in the form of a large table and a key word which would change with each letter sent. How did the code used by Marie Antoinette and Count Axel von Fersen work? Let's take the phrase, nous vous adressons, we address to you. First, you need a code table and a secret key word known to both correspondents. Here, the key word is depuis, since. 
Under nous vous adressons, you write the word depuis. The N is above the D, the O above the E, the U, P, and so on. Next, you turn to the code table. Each letter of the secret keywork in the left-hand column is associated with a series of coupled letters. The D under the N gives the couple NR, so the N becomes an R. The E under the O gives the letter R, and so on. So the phrase sent would be written When Thersen received a coded letter, he would write the new keyword under the coded text, and referring to the table, he obtained the actual text. However, we don't know how they chose the keyword and how they communicated it between them. We followed one lead for a while, because they both owned the same edition of the novel Paul et Virginie. There could have been numbers above the letters. Was it the page number and the order of the letters on the page? So we studied various editions of Paul et Virginie, but came up with nothing. Farewell. I am exhausted from writing. I have never written so much, and I am always afraid of forgetting something or making a mistake. Marie Antoinette spent a lot of time writing, not just to Fersen, but also to the Princesse de Lamballe to convince her to return. She sometimes wrote to the Duchess of Polignac, and she also spent time reading political memoirs and then writing resumes of them for Fersen. So she spent a huge amount of time writing. Marie Antoinette and Fersen also use chemicals or lemon juice to conceal their secrets. The words were revealed when the page was passed over a flame. The letters of Marie Antoinette that had already been published were in clear text, but sometimes there were three dots, which may have indicated missing text. When we managed to decipher the letters, we were able to fill in these holes and found that they were mostly words of love and affection for Axel de Fersen. But the deciphering gave no indications of political content. We have to give way to the storm. I wish that you do not go to Vienna. You stay near the King of Sweden and that you will be the least visible. In all of this, believe me, my gentle friend, I would like to owe you everything. I have strong reasons to make this request. Our happiness depends on it, since we would have no more happiness if we were separated forever. Farewell. Feel sorry for me. Love me. Above all, do not judge me in all what you will see me doing before you hear me. I would die if I was for a moment disapproved by the one I adore, and I will never stop adoring him. Next, the code breakers needed to discover what lay behind the redactions. Sophisticated squiggles and crossing outs, concealing words written more than 200 years ago. Line by line, layer by layer, with precision to the nearest tenth of a millimeter, the scanner maps the chemical makeup of the different inks used. After hours of data capture and analysis, words and phrases finally begin to appear. You whom I love and will love until my last breath. A year of painstaking work was carried out by the scientific teams, supported by the Laboratory of Heritage and Cultural Dynamics, to decipher 15 letters and their redacted passages. Here we still have a small area where we can't really see. Is this the only letter with particles? Yes, with so many of them in the way. I'll try again. You still can't read it? I'll do it again and test it. Here I'd say it's the end of a word. It looks better than here. Much better.
The problem with these letters was trying to dissociate the ink of the words from the ink used to hide them with the little squiggles. We analyzed the two inks and found they were both metallogallic, containing amounts of gallnut, iron sulfate and so on. We're now hoping that the metallic composition of the two inks will be different so that we can separate the two types of writing. Sometimes we can read directly, because luckily the first ink underneath contains an element that the other ink on top doesn't have. In that case, after a few hours of analysis, we can read directly. Unfortunately, for some letters, the ink compositions are very similar, so much so that you wonder whether it might be the same ink used for the redaction as for the original, and if so, we can't separate the two. These inks aren't like modern industrial inks. They're kind of homemade. If you shake the bottle, then dip your nib in and write, the ink will be more concentrated than when you next dip your nib in and write. Because the ink at the top will be thinner, as some of the components will have settled. I stopped here at horrible. I can't read anything after horrible. Sanction is my guess, but I'm not entirely sure. And situation? Oh no, not with the number. Not really, there's a T there. So the King of Sweden wanted to give me a place as grand, something or other, and then a Hussar regiment. The King of Sweden wanted to give me a place as grand, a Hussar regiment. So what I did with this area was, I mapped it again with a super resolution of 50 microns. And you found the number of letters? So we must look for posts that start with L, H or C or something. Exactly. So it's a post. A military post or something similar, I don't know. The King of Sweden wanted to give me a place as Grand Master and a Hussar regiment. It's very much interdisciplinary work. We develop and do what we can with the images. But after that, we have a series of exchanges with Isabelle Aristide at the National Archives. We have doubts about certain passages. Some are quite difficult to read. So we go back and forth with her, with her historical knowledge, the context, all the things we don't master. And that contributes a huge amount to our work and allows us to check, double-check, make corrections and progress further. When you try to read passages that are particularly difficult because the two inks are so close and the digital surface scratching only gives you snatches, you have to be very careful to not get carried away and substitute one word for another. Sometimes after spending hours on a passage, I stop and say, is this what we're really reading? Could it be something else? Am I wrong and giving a mistaken image of their relationship? After the return from Varennes, the fate of the king was still undecided. The assembly had suspended his powers and the royal family was still closely watched at the Tuileries Palace. Secretly advised by Barnave, a young moderate member of the assembly, Marie-Antoinette discovered that the king was obliged to ratify the constitution to be freed and save the monarchy. However, she fooled Barnave into believing that Louis XVI would readily accept this constitution. Fersen didn't get it. To him, accepting the constitution meant siding with enraged dissidents, as he called them. What's more, there was a misunderstanding between Marie Antoinette and Fersen due to the distance between them. Fersen didn't realize that the king and queen were obliged to ratify the constitution. It was their only chance of survival for them and the monarchy. With death in his soul, on September the 13th, 1791, Louis XVI swore to uphold the constitution. Great banquets were held to celebrate the constitutional monarchy, but the revolution was far from over. 
The king and queen were allowed a certain freedom, but began a suicidal political game of double standards. Our situation has changed since the king accepted the constitution. To refuse to do so would have been nobler, but impossible in our circumstances. It is my sad fate to be surrounded by wicked people. October 10th. I pity you for having to accept the Constitution. But I understand how dreadful your position is and that you had no alternative. Do you sincerely intend to side with the revolution? Do you not think there is another way? Do you need our help? Or do you wish us to seize all negotiation with the royal courts? Do you have a plan? And if so, what is it? What will become of us, my gentle friend? Without you, there can be no happiness. The world is nothing without you. To see you, to love you, to comfort you is all I desire. Goodbye, my dear and gentle friend. Never will I cease loving you. We know that's a D. Look closely and you can see it's a D and not an L. My dear and gentle friend, never will I cease loving you. Where do you see that? Loving. I don't know where you see that. You don't agree with me? I've spent several hours on it, going by the dots over the L's, which seem to be underneath and not added afterwards. And there's the tail of the D, first word, second letter. But is it underneath or above? So a word of one, two, three, four, five letters with D-I. So adieu, goodbye. Yes, and you can see the U of adieu. And then the last word, I thought it was adieu, but of course it's adoré, love. Now you say adoré, I can see it. That's the problem. And you can see that over adoré, he wrote a T in the redaction. So you need to forget that vertical line. But when you first see it, you wonder if the T might be underneath. My dear and gentle friend, my God, how cruel it is to be so near and not to be able to see each other, to tell you how much we love each other, and that I live and exist only to love you. Adoring you is my only consolation. The redacted passages reveal the true love that united Fersen and Marie Antoinette. We had a few love letters from the Queen, but nothing written by Fersen. And now we have our first love letters from him to the Queen. Louis XVI inspired deep distrust among the members of the Legislative Assembly. They were convinced he was supporting a counter-revolution inside the kingdom and abroad, where French aristocrats had sought refuge. December 5th. I deeply feel the horror of your position, but it will never change without foreign assistance or by excess of the evil. The present evil may give place to another, but you would always be miserable, and the kingdom would fall into dissolution. Never will you win the factious. They will accustom the people to no longer respect you and love you. Marie Antoinette took control of Louis XVI's secret foreign policy. And in this, Fersen had an extremely important role from his refuge in Brussels. He corresponded a lot with Marie Antoinette, acting as a kind of ambassador. December 9th, 1791. I think, like you, that evil alone cannot outdo good. But this is why we need a foreign force. The bishop should have told you already about the problems of writing to me. Only today, Monsieur de Laporte, who shows everything to the king, gave him your packet. The king now has water to bring out writing. Fortunately, he has not had the time, and I spirited away the letter. Therefore, dear friend, for the good of all three of us, beware of what you write, especially regarding political affairs. Goodbye, my friend. Marie Antoinette was determined to be very discreet about the affair, for the king's sake. She didn't want him to suffer from it, and she wanted him to perform as best he could his role as husband and king. So this was no ordinary trio. It would be necessary for me to see you. 
My God, how happy I would be. I would die of the pleasure. I could leave here with the same officer who brought you my letter last July. The pretext would be that I was visiting a gentleman who had kept my horses in saddle all summer. I would arrive in the evening at your apartments and would stay, if possible, until the following evening when I would leave. It seems feasible. It would be during December. We learn something extraordinary in this letter that Fersen was accustomed to visiting the Queen in her apartments because he says very naturally that he'll go to her place and stay until the following night. That shows it wasn't the first time he spent a night and a whole day with her. It is utterly impossible that you come at this time. It would compromise our happiness. And believe me when I say it, I have an extreme desire to see you. Sometimes I do not even hear myself, and I am obliged to think before realizing that it is indeed I talking. But what can one expect? How is your health? I wager you do not take care of yourself. You're wrong not to, because you are no longer master of it, and that your entire self is so dedicated to my existence that you must take care of your own health. I have not a moment to myself, what with meetings, writing, and seeing to my children. The latter occupation, though not the least, is my only happiness in your absence. And when I am sad, I take my small son in my arms and kiss him with all my heart. And that comforts me for a moment. Goodbye. And goodbye again. After how is your health, I wager you do not take care of yourself, you are wrong not to. The rest is redacted. You're no longer master of it and that your entire self is so dedicated to my existence that you must take care of your own health. That's very, very important. Because this is extremely personal. I was convinced we'd find something like that in this letter. But your entire self is dedicated to my existence. That's extremely powerful. It's heavily charged with emotion. Of course, it's not the language we'd use today. There's nothing saucy, no direct words, no situations described. In any case, we'll never find anything erotic, because these are letters between aristocrats, a queen and an aristocrat. It isn't a libertine correspondence. This was the 18th century, and people didn't mention sex in their letters. And as you said, there was a degree of restraint between them. To Fersen, Marie Antoinette was a friend on a pedestal, a queen. Perfect. And she said he was perfect, too. Absolutely. Excellent work. Yes, excellent. Magnificent. There are still a few frustrations and mysteries to solve, but we've made serious progress from our point of departure. On savait quand même we suspected that they did have a love affair, but we didn't have proof. And what's extraordinary, now we can see through the redactions, is that their love was hidden because the queen didn't have the right to fall in love. It was forbidden for a queen to love another man other than her husband. There are two hypotheses concerning the letters. In the 19th century, one of Fersen's descendants, Baron Kliegenstrom, published these letters, having supposedly destroyed others. But he could have kept them and redacted them to hide a text he felt would compromise his family's honor. It's also very likely that Fersen himself carried out for a number of letters a redaction because he kept them on his person and they would be intercepted if he were arrested. Fersen was determined to see the Queen and propose another escape from the Tuileries. But the Queen kept putting him off. This is no time to come, despite the pleasure I would have to see you again. 
But finally, early in 1792, Marie Antoinette agreed to Ferrison visiting her at the Tuileries. Fersen precisely told of his visit to the Tuileries in his diary, which is kept in the Royal Archives in Stockholm. February the 13th, fine and sunny, left at 9.30, arrived without incident at 5.30 in the evening without a word, went to her rooms, took my usual route, Fear of the National Guard. Her apartment a marvel. Didn't see the king. And then a blot. When someone tried to read, stayed there. The diary resumes Wednesday, February the 14th. Fine and sunny. Saw the king at 6 p.m. There's nothing noted between Tuesday evening and Wednesday evening. There has been a lot of speculation about what they did together, but what is certain is, because he said so in his memoirs, that he presented an escape plan to the king and queen, and once again it was turned down. There must have been some heated words between first and Marie Antoinette. They certainly declared their love to each other, but she must have told him that she was the queen and would remain at the king's side. So it was a very passionate visit for Fersen, but very cruel as well. Fersen kept a registry of the letters he sent to each of his correspondents. Marie-Antoinette appeared under the pseudonym of Josephine until February 1792. After that day of his visit, February the 14th, the pseudonym was dropped and replaced with the Queen of France. I think this was a precaution taken by a Swedish gentleman because the political situation was becoming more and more tense. All letters had to be shown to Louis XVI. And so the letters took on a more official character. You also wonder whether Fersen and Marie Antoinette's go-betweens were entirely trustworthy during that particularly delicate period. Most members of the Legislative Assembly agreed the counter-revolution inside France had to be put down and war declared on any nation supporting it on the outside. Armed conflict would force the king to take a stance for or against the revolution. This would be a test of truth for Louis XVI. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were hoping for only one thing, that France lose the imminent war, be invaded, that Paris be taken, and that foreigners would restore the king to the throne, along with the full powers he had before July 1789. April 19, 1792. I am dreadfully spied upon at this time. Perhaps I shall no longer be able to write to you. The ministers and the Jacobins will force the king to declare war on the House of Austria tomorrow. They hope this will frighten the emperor and that talks will open within three weeks. May God prevent this, so that at last we may be avenged for all the outrages inflicted upon us in this country. April 24th. I received yesterday the news of the declaration of war, and I am thankful. It is the best and only way to make up the minds of the powerful nations. The Empress of Russia has declared to Vienna her intention of actively intervening in France's affairs and that she would have the monarchy restored to what it was before the revolution. On April 20th, France declared war on the King of Bohemia in Hungary, and thus the Emperor, Francis II, Marie Antoinette's nephew. The war went extremely badly for France because its army had lost a huge number of officers who had emigrated. It was disorganized and incapable of coping with a war that had only just begun. So Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were rubbing their hands together. 
waiting for their moment of triumph, where revolutionary France would lose and they would recover their lost influence. In Paris, people began suspecting that something was up, and accusations were raised against the Queen. There was talk of an Austrian committee inside the Tuileries, which had leaked the campaign plans of the French army. And so there was a first riot on June 20, 1792. The king was forced to wear a revolutionary bonnet and drink to the health of the nation by the Parisians who had invaded the Tuileries palace and broken through the doors of the royal apartments with axes. Hasten, if you can, the succor which is promised us for our deliverance. I still exist, but it is a miracle. The 20th was an awful day. It was not I who was the chief object. It was my husband's very life they sought to take. They no longer conceal this. He showed firmness and strength, which made an impression upon them for the moment, but our danger may be renewed at any minute. Your situation fills me with worry. Your bravery will be admired, and the firmness of the king will have an excellent effect. You must continue in the same way, and most importantly, strive not to leave Paris. That is the capital point. It will then be easier to come to you. That is the Duke of Brunswick's plan. He will precede his entry with a strong worded manifesto in the name of the Allied powers who will render all France, and notably Paris, responsible for the persons of the royal family. The lives of the king and queen are in the greatest danger. A delay of one day may produce incalculable evils. The manifesto must be sent at once. It is awaited with great impatience. It will rally many persons round the king and secure his safety. The troop of assassins increases daily. They are working on the manifesto. I have written one which I gave to Monsieur de Limon. It is very good, and such as they ought to desire. Nothing is promised to anyone, no party is affronted, we are pledged to nothing. And Paris is made responsible for the king and family. If the least violence be offered to their majesties, the king, queen, and royal family, the emperor's forces will inflict an ever-memorable vengeance by delivering over the city of Paris to military execution and complete destruction, and the rebels guilty of the outrages to the punishment that they merit. It was an extremely violent manifesto and didn't have the desired effect at all. Because Fersen, on drawing on this text, hoped that the French would rally round the king and queen to protect them from the subversion of the capital. On the contrary, the people of Paris were furious, and thousands of them, from all districts, gathered around the Tuileries Palace, and at dawn, the palace was attacked. On the morning of August the 10th, an armed mob lined up in battle formation around the palace, demanding the removal of Louis XVI. Amid panic and confusion, the king and queen were advised to seek refuge at the assembly. Soon after their arrival, the battle broke out at the Tuileries. Three days later, the members of the assembly handed over the royal couple to the insurrectional commune of Paris, which locked them up in the temple prison. That same day, Fersen wrote a letter to Marie Antoinette, which she would never receive. August 10th. My concern for you is extreme. I do not have a moment's peace. I fear that you were unable to leave Paris. There would be no further letters between Marie Antoinette and the man she loved. Fersen learned of Louis XVI's execution on January the 21st, 1793. He strove in vain to save the life of the Queen, who in turn was executed on October the 16th that same year. He did, however, receive a final message from the Queen, scribbled on a piece of card. My heart is all yours. On the day after the execution, he wrote to his sister, She for whom I lived, for I have never ceased to love her, she whom I loved so much for whom I would have given a thousand lives, is no more. She lives no longer. My pain is so dreadful, I do not know how I can go on living. I wish to gather all the most minute details of this great and misfortunate princess, whom I will love all my life. Everything about her is precious to me. Oh, how I reproach myself for the wrongs I did her. I know now how much I loved her. 
And he would love her all his life. He would love her differently. He would place this misfortunate queen on a pedestal, blaming himself for not being able to save her and for not loving her enough. He would never marry. 17 years later, in Stockholm, Fersen died on the day of the funeral of the Crown Prince of Sweden after being attacked by an angry mob. A crazy rumor went round that he had also been poisoned. He died in atrocious conditions after being struck by swords, trampled on, and then his naked corpse dragged along the ground. Fersen was killed because he was a servant of traditional, absolute conservatism. So in a way, it struck an atrociously close parallel with the deaths of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Fersen, too, was the victim of mob fury. He would be found innocent by the Supreme Court of Sweden and buried in his family's vault in the church in Ljung. She whom I loved so much, for whom I would have given a thousand lives, is no more. She lives no longer. My pain is so dreadful I do not know how I can go on living. I shall end there, but not without telling you, my dear and gentle friend, that I love you madly. And there is never a moment in which I do not adore you. <laughs>